obscure anguish which had to do with the transience of beauty of life itself. It was his first conscious experience of the kind and it was not entirely welcome. Hi, welcome to Outlaw Bookseller, and it's time for some reviews, I thought. What have I been reading of late? Well, I've been reading lots of SF, that's the good news. So for those of you who don't like the other stuff I've been doing, well, it's nice to have some variety, and, you know, you expand yourself beyond the SF, and, you know, you get a different perspective, and I tend to pick things you'd probably like anyway. So there you go. So before we actually do the reviews, a couple of acknowledgements. First of all, thanks again to Bruce um, over in Toronto um, for sending me the Robert Sheckley Ness. Uh, I have mentioned it already, but I had a postcard from Bruce, another postcard from the um, Great Penguin SF postcards box set, which has been printed for years now, and this is Pulsar and the Anthologies, and a nice handwritten message. And um, he said he's enjoyed The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, which he um, picked out of my book, 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels. What a classic. Thanks again, Bruce. Very, very kind man. Thank you. Also, a thanks to Ian, who, after seeing my dilemma of not having the first of the Delaney Neverion stories in a format purchased me this he didn't purchase me he donated it to me for his own collection he said he's never got on with it extremely kind it's absolutely beautiful copy and i bagged it as you see and i'm going to read these i'm very conscious that i've not re reviewed any delaney on the channel i have talked about i and gomorra one of my favorite short stories and i've mentioned delaney many times and there was the video about the time they banned delaney and platt but i must do some more reviews because the thing is i read all the sort of famous stuff a long long time ago and that's the kind of difference between this channel and lots of others is i read these books a very very long time ago so that's why i'm not reviewing them but there is one look back at the past today so what are we going to do well the question today is is proficiency enough is it enough as a science fiction writer to be proficient? And in the real world of SF writers' careers, there's going to be times when, you know, they turn in work just to sort of keep the sort of coffers full, what have you. And, you know, all writers have to do that at some point, more or less, unless you're very lucky and you just happen to be a bestseller. You've had the reviews and the hype or what have you. So proficient, what does it mean? Pro from professional and efficient. We know what efficient means. So proficient. So is proficiency enough? So I read three books um, over the last week, and this question came to my mind when I read the first one of them. And that was because it's by a writer who I consider very proficient, and that's Jack McDevitt. And this is The Cassandra Project from 2012, and he co-wrote this with Mike Resnick. And I bought this in Forbidden Planet when I went to the signing for um, reports from the Deep End, the Ballard Anthology, a video which um, has got lots of writers in it. And I picked this up because it's A format, and I love A format paperbacks, as you know. Now, Mike Resnick, I've read a bit of, he's written an awful lot. He's written about 70 novels, and that sort of screams hack to me. And I've never been massively blown away by his work. I will admit I've not read much. I've read him in collaboration with Barry Marlsberg, who this is dedicated to because Marlsberg has been a friend of both McDevitt and Resnick. And my favourite book by McDevitt so far is The Hercules Text, which is his first novel, which I only read last year and reviewed last year. I also like Talent for War as well. And they're very, very readable and very proficient. So I want to talk about this in terms of proficiency and also about the book itself, of course. What I like about McDevitt's writing is that it's very readable. He's very adept at narrative thrust and he's great at character interaction. He's very good with characters. I think he's excellent at them. Now, Resnick, I'm not so certain of, as I say. Initially, I found the Cassandra Project was quite similar to the Hercules text because it focuses on a kind of thoughtful bureaucrat, somebody in sort of an office job, and you know they're not usually the heroes of sf novels especially hard sf novels and i like this real world approach and this is about a guy called jerry culpepper who is basically a pr man for nasa so you know he's got a pretty good job he sort of always harbored dreams of space travel he knows he'll never do it and he's worked for nasa for a long time and this is set in 2019 it was published in 2012 so let's just say it's set 10 years from now and 
McDevitt is really good at these sympathetic everyman type characters, and I really like the way he handles them, and I think that's a real virtue. So it's a near future book. NASA is underfunded, and Jerry, Jerry Culpepper is a little bit depressed at the situation because, you know, they're sort of making announcements and talking about what the sort of telescopes are seeing, but there isn't any sort of steps forward, and we're seeing this with the space program for a long time. And of course, we think, how is it that man landed on the moon 50 sort of years ago and very little happened since? And was it really all political, like Barry N. Marsberg said in his Apollo trilogy? And was it really just about winning the space race? And it does sort of feel that way, really, on the American side. And of course, we've seen the rise of private enterprise, people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk getting interested in space travel. And, you know, when is it all going to kick off again? You know, we sort of need to get this stuff done, don't we? But of course, there's still huge problems. So in the novel, Jerry is a sort of PR guy and he is a bit depressed with things and he performs the odd press conference and what have you. And then a mysterious snippet of audio recording from an Apollo mission, one of the missions before Apollo 11, the ones that didn't land on the moon, emerges. And it suggests that actually one of those missions at least went down to the moon, that there was a LEM, there was a landing vehicle that went down and landed on the dark side of the moon. And a tapestry emerges as bits and pieces come out. And of course, as a PR man, Jerry's job is to keep a lid on things and is to keep the narrative moving in the direction that the organization wants. But he does become very suspicious himself and he starts to think about the ethical issues involved and whether something mysterious actually happened. So there's a lot of media in this, there's a lot of politics. So it is kind of a conspiracy thrown away, but it's not in the sort of portentous Michael Crichton-esque way. It doesn't all feel sort of heavy and dark. It does feel more real world, you know, as if the media will take little things and blow them up. And it is interesting because it does reflect what's been happening in the media of late with the whole UAP thing, which I'm sure some of you have been following. I find it fascinating myself. The plot is complicated by the emergence of a character called Morgan Blackstone, known as Bucky. That's his nickname. And he's a kind of Elon Musk character. He's very, very rich, billionaire, and he is always very critical of NASA in sort of letting the space program flag. And he sort of says, you know, if presidents hadn't come along, decided to put this money elsewhere, we'd be on Mars by now. And he's going to launch a spaceship of his own and go to the moon. And it's a strange thing because it's very easy to sort of paint these characters as bad people. But again, the very wonderful approach that McDermott and Resnick use is that, you know, he is quite sympathetic as well. He's <laughs> irritating at times, but it's just because he wants to get things done. He actually has a really nice relationship with his underlings and he's always laughing and joking with them and you can see this working really well as a tv series and it does build to a climax which i must say i found a little bit predictable i could see what was going to come through but it was handled very subtly now this is the sort of book that if it was read from beginning to end in a sort of school or in an area in the bible belt or whatever in the states it would instantly get banned because the revelation at the end does remind me of a late 60s new wave novel i'm not going to tell you which one and it's kind of underplayed really and i, I did enjoy it but at the same time it was nearly 300 pages long and it was merely proficient it was proficient it's not great literature it's not badly written it's a work of popular fiction it's very very adept you know there are plenty of people working in all areas of popular fiction who would be very very sort of pleased to have this but i didn't enjoy it as much as the hercules text i didn't think it packed as much as a punch and i don't know if i put that down to resnick i don't think that's fair the question is am i going to read more of mcdevitt's work do I feel I've done him? I've only read three. I've read some bits and pieces. After this, I didn't, don't really feel the urge to read any more. I'm not sure if I'll get much more out of them, but I'm going to revisit Talent for War at some point and talk about that because that's kind of a neglected book these days, even though it's a Golang's masterwork. But this was proficient, but was that enough? Possibly not. Decide for yourselves, read it for yourselves. So one of the most proficient writers I've ever read is probably Bob Shaw. And I think Shaw, at his best, goes beyond proficiency and actually into literature. He was uneven. He did some books that I'm not so keen on. I've read more or less all of them. 
There are a few I haven't read which I'm mopping up gradually when I'm in a sure mode. I've sort of kept him back. I like to do that with writers. I like to hold a few things back. I never sort of burn through him. I started reading him in the late 70s and I went back to a book of his from the late 70s, which I must have read three or four times back then. I think I've sort of glanced through it since then at least once. But I decided to give it a thorough reread because Matt Bookpilled um, reviewed it quite recently. And I know I'd said to Matt that I really liked this book. And that's A Wreath of Stars by Bob Shaw. And this is the first edition here in a Golanx yellow jacket, which I know some of you can't stand and I absolutely love. And this dates to 1976, I believe. Let me just have a look. 76, yeah. I would have read this about 78, I think. And this is the UK Panel Osmonds paperback. Very beautiful there, as you see. And it's yellow on there. And so it looks like a bit like a door. I always thought that if I can ever start an A format paperback SF line, oh, if only I could, then I would um, have a livery, which was a cross between the panel orange and door, because people would love that. Can you imagine a rack spinner filled with such beautiful things in your local bookshop or bookstore if you're in the US? That'd be something, wouldn't it? So, Wreath of Stars. And... I've always liked this book a lot. I mean, my first three shows were Other Days, Other Eyes, which is his masterpiece. There isn't any doubt about that. Sublime book. Then I read Who Goes Sure, which is very, very funny. Very Shackley-esque book, but probably a bit better organised and less episodic than Shackley. And to my way of thinking, much funnier than the Stainless Steel Rat books, which I was always disappointed by the Harry Harrison ones. And then I read this. And when I read this as a young guy, this very much came across to me as very allergic. It's a book about an outcast. It's about avoiding things and it's about isolation. And the Wreath of Stars, the title is metaphoric. Just to discuss the plot, the basic idea is summed up really well by the blurb on the back of the panel lozenge. And I'm going to read that to you. And it says, Thornton's planet is an anti-neutrino planet detected on its approach to Earth. It can be seen only through the newly developed Magnilect lenses and its arrival causes a wave of panic. When its course carries it past the Earth, interest in Thornton's planet wanes. Then there comes news from the African state of Burandi. The miners, wearing Magnilect glasses, have seen ghosts in the mine passages. The visit of Thornton's planet has had effects which nobody could have expected. So that sums up the basic idea of the plot. And really, this focuses upon three characters. The protagonist really is a guy called Gilbert Snug. And Gilbert is somebody who describes himself as a human neutrino. It says this in the very first line. And he's an aero engineer. And he describes himself as a, as a neutrino because a neutrino is a particle which is very difficult to detect. And it's very hard to find even now and it sort of passes through things without anybody being aware of it and he very much wants to be that sort of person he comes from a background i think he's an orphan and he's somebody who tries to avoid contact with other people he drinks a lot and he's traveled around the world as an aero engineer sort of hiring himself out and as a consequence he, he ends up working a lot in the middle east and africa and he's working in this area and there's an incident where he is forced to flee with a colleague and to take an aeroplane which crashes in this small African Republic where he is effectively held prisoner by the local hunter. And this is rather interesting because it takes us back to the days of Africa in the 1970s. And of course, at that time, Idi Amin was in Uganda and we were seeing more and more as white man's burden, as it was laughingly called, receded, and as former colonial territories took on their own administration, that unfortunately a lot of them were very, very corrupt and despotic. And this goes on to this day, and they're still rife with tribal issues and what have you, and Africa seems unable to escape from this. Now, you could say that this is down to colonialism and it's white man's fault, but who can say really? I mean, let's take the case of Haiti. Haiti's in the news a lot recently. And Haiti's been an independent republic for over 200 years. So, you know, maybe there is something to it. I mean, obviously, that's Afro-Caribbean, not African. But it does reflect that. And obviously, this is set in the future. The time it's written, um, say, 76 was written, is set towards the very end of the millennium. And obviously, it doesn't always come up to our vision of what's happening now. But it is a fascinating novel. So we see this thing where this invisible planet is coming towards Earth. And it's only noticeable through the magnilic lenses. Now, these are a kind of 
spectacles which are blue that you can wear and they're often called amp lights in them and a astronomer called Fulton sees this planet coming and he makes his discovery and this brings in a character called Boyce Ambrose and Boyce Ambrose is a guy who runs a planetarium in the States and he's not a hardcore scientist he knows he's kind of bought himself into his position because he's quite wealthy and he is about to get married and he's not certain about the woman he's going to get married to so when he hears about this news of the miners in Africa seeing these ghosts when they're wearing amp light lenses because they're good for seeing in the dark and this is a typical Shaw optical thing. Shaw wrote several novels looking at optics as part of physics. First of all, Nightwalk, his first novel, which is a great romp of a novel, a great fun novel, which is about a prison escape on a distant planet where a guy uses a certain sort of optical technology to see through other people's eyes and even the eyes of animals. And it's a fantastic fun book. And that was an early show for me as well. And then, of course, there's slow glass in Other Days, Other Eyes. I'll stop now and say if you haven't read Other Days, Other Eyes, you must read it. It should be your first show and it's easily the finest one, as I've said. So Gilbert Snook ends up in this country where this mine is and where the miners are seeing these ghosts through their amplite magnolite lenses underground. And Ambrose Boyce is heading over to investigate this phenomenon. He meets on the way a woman called Prudence and Prudence works, works for UNESCO and she's a tall willowy blonde and the three of them intersect like planetary bodies in a wreath of stars in the African Republic of Burundi. And, you know, there are sympathetic um, characters of colour in this, but there are some unpleasant ones as well. So, but that's the reality of the world. I mean, people are what they are. They're, all races have good and bad in them. It's that simple. So the book is stuffed with all sorts of physics and cosmology, which Shaw excesses at. There's some great explanations of what's actually happening. And you will have guessed it by now that these ghosts are actually aliens from a neutrino planet. And it's fascinating stuff. And this has massive implications, particularly for Snook. And the whole book, really, what happens in it is a metaphor for his avoidance of situations and how this hasn't made him happy and how he will end up an isolated outcast, which he wanted to be, but secretly doesn't want to be. So there is another side to this besides the wonderful scientific extrapolation. And I loved it. And I think for me, the great moment in the book comes where he really becomes aware of his dilemma. And Shaw does some emotive writing in his books, particularly in Other Days, Other Eyes. And there's less emotive stuff in this. It is quite action packed and there's a lot of incident and it does sort of keep you reading. But there's a wonderful moment in here where Snook basically falls for Prudence and he doesn't really have much of a chance with her. And he's very awkward and I say he drinks a lot. And in a way, he reminded me of the sort of characters that Graham Greene excelled at in his serious novels in colonial situations where these people were hiding from the world and they had sort of secret despair and what have you. And I'm just going to read you this little sequence. Um, bear with me a moment. This is the moment where Ambrose is asking Gil Snook what he's actually seen in the mine through his lenses. Gil, have you any idea of what you actually did see in the mine? Ambrose tapped Snook's knee to regain his attention. Do you know what you discovered? I saw some things which looked like ghosts. Snook had just made a more immediate discovery that in moody relaxation, Prudence Devenel's profile inspired in him an obscure anguish which had to do with the transience of beauty of life itself. It was his first conscious experience of the kind, and it was not entirely welcome. Obscure anguish, which had to do with the transience of beauty of life itself. It was his first conscious experience of the kind, and it was not entirely welcome. So Snook has hidden his feelings even from himself, and he's avoided things. And this has resulted in isolation, which turns into a kind of love for prudence. And I say it's a very allergic book from then on, because there are implications, of course, for the aliens themselves in their sudden appearance in the mines of Burundi in Africa. And I think it's a book with more depth than has been given credit to it. And even though it's not the most elegantly written of Shaw's books, that's Other Days, Other Eyes. As Martin Amos said back at this point, he said after Ballard, Shaw is pretty much the best we've got. And I'm not sure I'd go that far. I would have put my money towards Priest and M. John Harrison, though maybe M. John wasn't as developed as that point. But it is an excellent book. So if you haven't read A Wreath of Stars, do read it. I think it's quite thoughtful. There's a lot of meat in it if you like the hard science. So it is really worthy of a proper look.
it's more than proficient. So then, Silverberg. Now, of course, the major Silverberg works, I read them all a long time ago. And then there's the famous moment after his four year hiatus in 76 to 1980, when he writes Lord Valentine's Castle, which performs very, very well in the USA, particularly, which is a fantasy novel. It's not a science fiction novel. Yes, it's set on another planet, but there's actual magic in it, so it's a fantasy novel. And after that, he produced sporadically and didn't put as much of himself into it because he said himself that he had really poured his heart and his soul into the works between 67 and 76. And, you know, they had great critical acclaim, but they didn't always sell that brilliantly. And it was if there was too much for readers or for me, it was perfect. So the later Silverbergs, I've never really engaged with in the same way, but this is one that I hadn't read, and this is The Face of the Waters, which is from the early 90s, which is actually one of his last full-length novels, and very, very beautiful Grafton edition here, as you can see. And what's fascinating about this is that this um, doesn't have the four themes which I regard as being central, the Silverberg's corpus, and the four themes which come up again and again in the key books are power, redemption, transformation and transcendence. Now transformation and transcendence are related but they're not the same thing and we sort of come on to that really. And interesting about this one, this isn't really about power, it is about transcendence, transformation and arguably redemption but that comes very late in the book. And there are some similarities to Downward from the Earth but it's not as elegiac and it's not as moving. And again, there is this sense that what Silverberg's doing is he's being very professional and writing these very well-crafted books, these very proficient books, but he isn't always pulling his whole self into them. But it's not without his charm, and I did really, really enjoy it. So the basic scenario is that it's the year 2450, and the book is set on a planet called Hydros, which is a water world. Hydros, obviously, hydration, water, we know what's going on there. And Fundamentally, what's happened is that Earth has been destroyed by a solar flare some time before, some generations before, but 80 years before. And just before that happens, even though mankind has explored the cosmos, a lot of people have left Earth and gone out to different worlds. So the home world is gone. And it's a great shame because the central character is a character called Lola, who is a doctor who has never been on Earth. He has some artifacts from Earth inherited from his grandfather, but he's always lived on Hydros, never been anywhere else. But he feels a nostalgia and a sense of loss for lost Earth. And Silverberg's love of history, the history of our planet, and how that fed into his creation of SF worlds, really comes through in this. So it's kind of allergic thing in this as well, though not as strong as in Wreath of Stars, I wouldn't say. So fundamentally, what you get in this is you get some great world building, because Hydros is entirely covered in water. That's very unusual, of course. It has no natural rocky islands. It does have islands. The islands are made of reconstituted, dried, plant matter from the oceans of Hydros and they're created by the native inhabitants who the humans on Hydros call the Gillies, dwellers are, is their official name. And they are large hulking aliens and they built these floating islands and there are several of them scattered around this planet and there are human beings on all of them but they tend to live separately to the Gillies who have a sort of quiet intolerant tolerance for human beings. And everybody comes to Hy Hydros. If you decide to come to Hydros in an escape capsule or something like that, or in a pod from a passing starship, you're there forever because there's no spaceport. You can't get off there. And the local inhabitants won't let spaceports be built. They're at a low level of technology. They do have some form of power which they're working on. But the human beings live in small colonies. So the people on Hydros all come from this one island in this book. And our cast of characters have lived on this island. They all know each other really well. And Lawler is their doctor, as I say. And he's inherited his knowledge from his father who taught him. So he's a very important part of the community. But he's not a powerful person. He's influential, but not powerful. The Silverberg power-based character is absent from this book in that respect. Unfortunately, one of the people living on this particular island, which is called, let me have a look. The island is called Sorv. Um, does something which doesn't sit well with the Gillies and the people rejected from the island and they leave in a fleet of ships because there's a lot of fishing that goes on as you would expect and they decide to try and find another island to live on so they go off in these six ships and the narrative then focuses on the one ship and this references to Homer as you'd expect 
and there's lots of incident with the flora and fauna of the planet which is really really well described and Silverberg uses his natural storytelling skills and inventiveness in the world building here so if you like world building particularly biological world building this is really really good and they make their way across the oceans and there is a mysterious zone on the planet called the face of the waters which some people think is an actual island and it's very very large and nobody's ever been there and of course with any sea voyage in a narrative it doesn't go smoothly because something that the ship has to cope with is that in essence Hydros is part of a double system there's another planet so it's a binary so we go back to that whole thing that comes from Asimov's Nightfall that's in the three body problem it's in Night of Light by Philip Jose Farmer and um, it's in Racks by Michael Coney about how the movement of the planetary bodies affects things and obviously an ocean planet its tides on earth of course affected by a moon hydros has three moons which is small but it has this other planet and in the sky there's a massive massive star system called the cross which reminded me of the southern cross this blazing cross of stars which bisects the sky so this is very sort of good material for a poet like Silverberg and it does have its moments of lyricism and beauty um, one thing I didn't like in it there's quite a bit of swearing in it and that felt unusual for Silverberg there's a lot of the F word in it and you know while that works for Ian Banks fans it doesn't work for me and it's not that I'm a pro the fact is is that it doesn't essentially feel in place but it was commonly used enough in this for it to become obviously part of the local parlance there's a fair amount of sex in the book because this is a small community and um, you know there is a little bit of romance and what have you but nothing that would offend me I mean a lot of people seem to have a problem with Silverberg and his treatment of women and what I would say is that he's writing about men a lot and that isn't a problem he should be allowed to write about men I think you know the the female characters that's entirely sympathetic and the central one if there is a central female character I would say there is she is very much a woman of, of her own means you know and a woman who does what she likes and she's as free in fact freer probably than Lola the main protagonist so this builds to a climax as they eventually find themselves heading toward the face of the face of the waters and the face of the waters of course is a biblical quotation from Genesis it does mean something I'm not going to tell you what it means but the story ends with those classic Silverberg themes of transformation transcendence redemption but not essentially power but Lawler is subject possibly to a power but he isn't powerful is he redeemed he certainly becomes transcendent and then transformed but is he redeemed we don't really know I would say and I was reasonably uncomfortable with the conclusion of this and Lola was certainly fighting against it as well and I'm not certain if I would sort of go that way so I didn't find this as personally transcendent as personally redemptive and as personally empowering and transformative as books such as the book of skulls dying inside downward to the earth and the time of changes man in the maze and um, those are the great ones for me I didn't think it was that great but I really enjoyed reading it but it is that thing where you've got this very very highly developed artist who can turn out a story easily really well written great fun to read but it lacked the power that you find from those earlier books but I nevertheless really enjoyed it and I will be reading some more Silverberg which I haven't read soon and there's going to be a video coming out which is about my Silverberg collection in a bit more depth so is proficiency enough maybe not of those three books which do I like like the most I still like Wreath of Stars the most and I think it's underrated so I'll leave that with you there'll be more reviews probably in a few weeks time I hope you've enjoyed that. Do check out my new channel, of course, Warby Bookseller. There's some beautiful visuals on there for those of you who like to see me out and about. And thanks for watching, and bye for now. Cheers.